Hi, I'm Gordon from Camera Labs, and this is my review of the Sigma 24mm f3.5 DGDN, a compact wide angle prime lens for full frame mirrorless cameras, and at the time I made this review, available in Sony E and Leica L mounts at a price of $549 US dollars or £479. 24mm is actually one of my favourite focal lengths, striking a very usable balance between 28mm and ultra wide models. That 4mm difference from 28 doesn't sound like much, but actually it captures a comfortably broader field of view with a more exciting perspective, while also avoiding the distortion of ultra wide models. It's perfect for landscapes, tight interiors, and even some environmental portraiture, including handheld vlogging. And in this review, I'll show you how the Sigma performs in practice. The 24 3.5 was announced in December 2020 alongside a 35mm f2 and 65mm f2, all DGDN models, but part of Sigma's new I series, which also includes the existing 45mm f2.8. Here's the 24, 35, and 45 models, and what differentiates the I series from other Sigma contemporary models are their compact sizes, along with some interesting design ideas that I'll show you in this review. Not to be outdone on the compact front, Sony themselves announced three new prime lenses in March 2021 at a similar price to the Sigma models. Here's the 24 2.8, 42.5 and 52.5, all sharing not just the same $599 price tag as each other, but also identical styling. So with two compact 24mm primes launched for the E-mount within a few months of each other, we have a natural head-to-head. -head. So in this review, I'll be directly comparing the design, quality and features of the Sigma 24 3.5 against the Sony 24 2.8. Let's start with coverage, and to put 24mm into perspective, I'm going to start with a view captured when shooting with the Sigma 45mm f2.8 DGDN, which delivers very natural looking perspective and magnification. And by the way, that's a great lens if you're after standard coverage, but something a little bit different from a traditional 50mm. Now for the Sigma 24mm f3.5, showing how much broader the field of view is from the same position. And next for the Sony 24mm 2.8, which interestingly is actually delivering a slightly wider field of view from the same position and mounted on the same camera. Now it's not uncommon for lenses with the same quoted focal length to actually capture slightly different fields of view in practice, sometimes due to their optical construction, sometimes due to software correction later. And as I'll show you in a moment, the Sony 24 2.8 is actually capturing an even wider field of view when you're shooting in RAW, before then cropping it slightly to correct for geometry. But the end result remains a little wider than the Sigma. At 64 by 49 mm the Sigma lens on the right is a little narrower and longer than the Sony 24 2.8 on the left, and at 225 grams, it's a little heavier too. But once they're both mounted on a body, you won't notice much difference in size and weight. They do have quite different designs and controls though. Despite its compact size, the Sigma 24 3.5 separates its aperture and focusing ring sufficiently to avoid accidental operation of the other. And thanks to knurling on either side of the aperture scale, this aperture ring is also wider than the Sony. Now it does lack the additional controls of the Sony 24, but it's less cramped as a result and has an attractive vintage style. The Sigma lens takes larger 55mm filters. Meanwhile, Sony's 24 2.8 has a tactile but very narrow aperture ring with a smooth focusing ring positioned right alongside it. Again, it's a little bit cramped compared to the Sigma, but impressively, Sony's also managed to squeeze in a small customizable focus hold button, as well as the chance to de-click the aperture ring with a switch, features that are both missing from the Sigma lens, not to mention most other small lenses. The filter thread in the Sony is smaller too, measuring 49mm. Both lenses are described as being dust and splash proof with subtle rubber grommets at their mounts, although Sigma's ceiling doesn't extend to the whole barrel, whereas Sony's does. Both lenses are also supplied with quite different lens hoods. The Sony 24 2.8 on the left comes with a short cylindrical hood, while Sigma supplies a more substantial petal lens hood that obviously occupies more space in a bag, but provides greater protection. I quite like that ribbed styling on the Sigma hood that ties in with the vintage look of the lens, although it may attract dust over time. Uniquely, Sigma also supplies not one, but two different lens caps with its i-series lenses. First is a traditional plastic cap with spring-loaded clips, but second is a metal disc which attaches magnetically with a satisfying snap, and the magnets feel strong enough to keep it in place too. With the hood mounted though, this second cap does become a little awkward to fit or remove, so it is arguably a bit of a novelty, but I do like that Sigma's trying something different here. 
In terms of focusing in single AFS mode on an Alpha 1, the Sigma 24 3.5 is fairly swift and like most Sigma lenses I've tested on Cerny bodies, employs a minor contrast based wobble at the end to confirm accurate focus. Cerny's own lenses seem to avoid this wobble in AFS mode or perhaps do it so fast as to be effectively invisible, but if you switch either of them to AFC or continuous autofocus, the wobble goes away entirely and the process becomes faster too. As a demonstration, here's the Sigma 24 3.5 refocusing for movies where the autofocus is set to continuous, and you'll see that wobble has gone and it looks pretty confident. For comparison, here's Sony's 24 2.8, again for movies where the performance is similar. Next for a face detection test with the Sigma 24 3.5, again for movies in continuous autofocus with wide area and human eye detection enabled. Now the 24mm focal length may not be your first choice for portraiture, but if the subject's positioned carefully it can work for environmental compositions where you see more of the surroundings, plus it's an ideal focal length for handheld vlogging. Meanwhile the Sony 24 2.8 does an equally good job at keeping me in sharp focus as I move around the frame. Let's now take a closer look in a stills portrait comparison. I'm starting with the Sigma 24 3.5 with its aperture wide open where it's possible to achieve a small amount of blurring in the background. Taking a close look at the Sigma portrait shows very sharp details on my eyeball as driven by the Alpha 1's eye detection and it proves the lens has sufficient resolution even for the Alpha 1 sensor. I should mention though the hit rate on focused eyeballs wasn't quite as high as using Sony's own 24 2.8 so I'd recommend taking several shots to be sure. Moving sideways for a look at the rendering shows minor blurring in the background, although for greater subject separation you'll understandably need faster or longer lenses, inevitably bigger and more expensive too. That said, for a compact wide angle lens with a modest 3.5 aperture, the style is actually quite attractive. Now briefly back to the full view from the Sigma for a moment, before switching to the Sony 24 2.8 from the same position, where again you'll notice it has a fractionally wider field of view. Here's a close look with the Sigma on the left and the Sony on the right, where you can see both are capable of capturing very fine details. Now in my tests I found the Sony lenses delivered close to a 100% hit rate with face and eye detection, whereas the Sigma lenses were a little lower, at least when using eye detection on the Alpha 1. That said, I still managed to get plenty of focused portraits with the Sigmas, just not every single one of them. Comparing their rendering styles in the background though tells an interesting story. Looking closely, the slightly faster f2.8 aperture on the Sony is indeed delivering slightly larger blurred shapes than the 3.5 of the Sigma, but compare their edges and you'll see the Sigma's rendering is smoother with more gradual transitions compared to the sharper edges of Sony's bokeh blobs. It's a personal choice of course, but I prefer the look of Sigma's rendering here even though its aperture is actually a tad slower. Next for the rendering of bokeh balls from close range, starting with the Sigma 24 3.5. Now from this distance it's possible to generate small bokeh balls, but like most lenses of this size and price, there's outlining around their edges and some faint patterns within. With the lens closed to f4 or smaller, the 7 bladed diaphragm system also becomes visible, with blobs taking on a 7 sided shape. Here's the Sigma 24 3.5 on the left and the Sony 24 2.8 on the right, both at their maximum apertures and from the same distance. As seen on previous comparisons, the Sigma captures a slightly tighter field of view, which in turn compensates for the slightly slower aperture to deliver similarly sized blobs in this test. In terms of rendering style, neither lens is free from artifacts, but Sony's on the right shows visibly sharper outlining versus the smoother edges from the Sigma on the left. Now there's no right or wrong here, but I personally prefer the softer background rendering of the Sigma. In terms of minimum focusing distances, Sigma quotes 10.8 centimeters for the 24 3.5, and here's what I could achieve from as close as I could focus it, reproducing a subject size of just 6.5 centimeters across the frame, albeit quickly becoming soft away from the middle. Now here's the Sigma 24 at the top and the Sony 24 at the bottom, both from their closest focusing distances. Sony quotes 24 centimeters with autofocus or 18 centimeters in manual, so you're looking at the latter where it's reproducing a subject size of just over 17 centimeters across the frame. And impressively, even with the aperture wide open, the details are pretty sharp right up to the edges. So the Sony is noticeably sharper here in a macro-ish environment, but if you can close down the Sigma or shoot it from a bit further away, the image quality certainly does improve. At the other end of the scale, here's my distant landscape scene, starting with the Sigma 24 3.5 on the Alpha 1, at f3.5, and with the view angled so that details run right into the corners. Zooming in on the middle section reveals very crisp details at the maximum aperture, with no benefit to closing it down to improve the quality further. 
Moving out to the far corner proves the lens can maintain the detail, again with the aperture wide open. There's unsurprisingly some vignetting or darkening in the corners at f3.5, but this reduces as you gradually close the aperture. Toggling between uncorrected RAW files and the in-camera JPEG versions on the Alpha 1 reveals there's no geometric correction supplied by default, although applying it from the lens menu of the Alpha 1 did improve some barrel distortion. Compare that to toggling between RAW and JPEG versions shot with the Sony 24 2.8 and you'll see the JPEGs are benefiting from both geometric correction and compensation for vignetting. With the Sigma 24 3.5 on the left and the Sony 24 2.8 on the right, showing magnified views of their central areas, you'll see both perform very well at their respective maximum apertures, although again the Sigma's view is a little tighter. Switching to their corners and again that difference in coverage means we're looking at different details but from the same part of the frame. Both are a little softer in the corners compared to their central areas and there's darkening due to vignetting too, but overall their performance for distant subjects is fairly similar here and once stopped down they become essentially neck and neck. Just before wrapping up a few comments for videographers. 24mm is a nice focal length for handheld vlogging and you can see here at f3.5 there's a little subject separation with the background, although if you intend to apply stronger digital stabilisation which incurs a crop, you may begin to find it not quite wide enough. If you intend to use active steady shot or post stabilization in Catalyst, I'd suggest using the wider Sony 20mm 1.8 or the Samyang 18mm 2.8. And if you intend to crop a lot, maybe even the Sigma 60mm 1.4 for APS-C sensors could be an option to consider. And finally a focus breathing test starting with the Sigma 24 3.5 manually focusing from infinity to the closest distance and back again at f22. Now as you focus closer on the Sigma, the field of view reduces, although at the time I tested it on the Alpha 1, I actually had to perform the full focus pull in several steps. And now for the Sony 24 2.8, which actually has the opposite effect, so as you focus the lens closer, the field of view increases. So neither lens is immune from the effect of focus breathing. Now it's time for my final verdict, and as I wrap up my review of the lens, I'll show you a bunch of images I shot with the Sigma 24 3.5 on the Alpha 1. As always, you can access the original images for closer inspection via my review of the lens at cameralabs.com. The Sigma 24mm f3.5 DGDN is an attractive lens for wide-angle photographers who value portability, not to mention that mid-range pricing, over the shallowest depth of field or smoothest rendering. It plays to its strengths, delivering sharp results across the frame, even on high resolution bodies, coupled with fast focusing and a retro inspired design aesthetic. Deciding between it and the Sony 24 2.8 is a tricky one though, as both share a similar size, quality and even price. Sony appears to have the advantage with a slightly faster aperture, but in my tests I saw barely any difference in depth of field and actually ended up preferring the slightly smoother rendering of the Sigma. Firmer in Sony's favour though are the focus hold button, declickable aperture ring and weather sealing that extends beyond the mount, all features lacking from the Sigma. Now depending on your needs this could give the Sony the edge, but countering it are a less cramped barrel, a slightly lower retail price and personally speaking more attractive physical styling. Now one or more of these features may seal the deal for you, or if you intend to collect more than one model in their respective series, you may wish to stick with that one for consistency. But I think for most people the decision may simply rest on which presents better value at the time of buying. But that's assuming you're in the E-mount system. If you're an L-mount owner, Sigma is almost single-handedly expanding the range of compact and affordable lenses, and I salute them for it. Ultimately, the Sigma 24mm 3.5 DGDN is a compelling option for Sony owners and a no-brainer for the L-mount. The aperture may sound modest at first, but unless you're an astro or low-light shooter, it'll rarely impact your day-to-day -day work, and more importantly allows for a compact lens at a mid-level price that transforms even larger bodies into satisfyingly portable systems. If you're after a 24 with a faster aperture and more attractive rendering, you're going to need to spend more on models like Sony's 24mm 1.4 G Master. That's a gorgeous lens, but it's bigger and it's roughly twice the price of the Sigma. If your budget won't extend beyond $600 or you simply prefer that compact lens, then the Sigma is a great choice, although do compare it very closely with the Sony 24 2.8. The bottom line though is the E-mount owners now have two very attractive and fairly affordable wide-angle prime lenses in this classic focal length to choose from. Right, that's it for this review. As always, if you found any of it useful, you can reward me with a like and a follow. It only takes a moment to click. And if you're feeling extra generous, you could treat me to a coffee or treat yourself to my in-camera photography book or how about a nice Camera Labs t-shirt. And there's links to everything, including the latest prices below. 
Oh, and if you're interested, I also have reviews of the Sigma 35 f2 and all three of the compact Sony lenses. Let me know which one's your favourite. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.